resurgent volcanism in Iceland, a Google Earth field trip, and the earth mantle evidence for a giant impact moon formation theory. Welcome to the Geology Hour, our monthly gathering of geology enthusiasts, brought to you by the Geological Society of the Oregon Country with support from the Beverly Vote Scholarship Fund and the Portland State Department of Geology. Well, let's start with Brett, who has the, the hottest news off the press, including, uh, I think, something that may have happened in the last 24 hours. Brett, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, so I'm Brett. I'm a second year master's student. I actually study uh, hydrogeology. So this volcano stuff, I'm going stuff I usually don't study. So it's kind of fun for a change. So what I'm covering right now is the Grindavik Iceland volcanism, which has been uh, occurring over the past uh, two weeks. Uh, but first, just over last night, uh, Mount Etna erupted again. Yeah, so when I woke up this morning, this is right on my news feed, so I thought this is pretty interesting. Mount Etna is the most active volcano in all of uh, Europe, so this happening is not that rare, but still pretty cool to look at. What kind of volcano is it? It is a strata volcano, and it's due to the collision between the Eurasian plate and the African plate. So. If a comparison could be made with our Cascadian volcanoes that are subduction volcanism related. Could you make that comparison and have us imagine one of our volcanoes erupting in a similar fashion? Uh, from what I understand, uh, it smells like hood. Okay. From front of my wow. what I've read about, so. All right, so let's go back to Iceland. So the loca location, so uh, Grindavik is a small fishing town located on the Southern peninsula of Iceland. Uh, it was first settled in uh, 934 AD. And this town actually stands on a on a lava field and is situated over a bunch of little eruption fissures due to uh yeah, due to the due to the extensional regime in the area. A cool tourist location is actually the Blue Lagoon, which is in danger of being covered by uh, lava. And the reason why this this water is so blue is due to the high silica content. So here's a quick review of the timeline of events. So Iceland, there's an average of about 300 earthquakes a week. So it's always seismically active due to its location on a rift. Uh, but during October the 25th, it started increasing two or 500 a day. A day. And then on November 10th, it shot up to over 1,000 per day. And due to this, uh, residents were told to evacuate. In following days, there was road ruptures and structural damage. And right here is a good map showing the swarm of earthquakes. They use earthquakes as kind of like a, a predictive tool. Because once you get these high, large swarms of earthquakes, you know that uh, the, the magma chain has started to move. So right here, are some examples of some uh, surface damage in the region. So right here, it's movement on a fault. Right here is some of the damage in town. Uh, so right here, the, the gas coming up due to uh, the rift right here, uh, I guess. So when they was told to evacuate, no one, they, they didn't have time to gather like their animals and stuff. So after this rift was occurring, I guess all the animals went and hid down here due to being warmer than I was outside. So <laughs> yeah, and yeah, here's another good picture of it. Now, Iceland is uh, the most volcanic, uh, Iceland's the most volcanic uh, eruptive place on earth. And this right here is just a historical graph of eruptions. So on average, there's about 30 eruptions every uh, 10 years. But as you see in this graph, uh, you have alternating periods of higher high eruptions with uh, lower eruption periods. And this region, there's also been some uh, nearby eruptions in the last five years. Uh, Fagradis scale erupted, has erupted over three times since 2021. It's the first eruption in this area in Iceland in over 800 years. And this volcano was nicknamed the tourist volcano just because uh, it kind of has like the same Hawaiian type of volcanic eruptions where tourists can actually stand outside near this region right here and watch the lava come out. Now, a quick review on the tectonic setting. Iceland is located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But if you notice right here, 
looking all throughout the ocean ridges. It's the only large island located on the ocean ridge. And here are some examples of this ridge setting in Iceland. Uh, you can walk on the North Atlantic, North North American plate and the Eurasian plate. And right here, there's actually a bridge between continents. So Iceland is, is, is located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. As you can see right here is what we call the Mature Ridge. <clears throat> and the spreading rate on this ridge is about two centimeters a year. But as you can see, why is Iceland above sea level? Sea level? This normally does not occur along oceanic ridges. And this is due to Iceland's hotspot, which is pretty similar to what we see in Hawaii, but it lacks the, the continuous volcanic chain. Now, the oldest rocks in Iceland are about 16 to 22 million years. And this entire region right here is known as large igneous province. There's about 10 million cubic kilometers of magma. Now, this hotspot has migrated over the years, from, as you can see right here, located in Greenland and Iceland. So the principal elements of Iceland geology is three main rifts in Iceland. These extraterrestrial regimes generate snowball faulting and strike slip faulting, uh, frequent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The interesting thing about Iceland is that 80% of the eruptions in Iceland occur right here in the eastern volcanic zone. And there are two main types of volcano volcanoes, fissure swarms and central volcanoes. Now, basalt is the most common volcanic product in Iceland. However, eruptions are usually explosive, which is quite different than what we see in Hawaii. This is due to their interaction between uh, the solid ice and the magma. And right here, there's two main types. There's two main types. There's effusive eruption right here. As you can see, tourists are able to actually watch here and look at it. And then explosive type right here. Uh, this is from the volcano in 2010, uh, which caused over... 100,000 delays in flights. So right here is just a little uh, cross section of the dike swarms that occur in Iceland. These, these dike swarms are, are fed by a, res by a reservoir located uh, due to the hot spot. There are two main types of dike swarms in Iceland. These large sheet, local sheet swarms and regional dike swarms. Uh, the regional dike swarms are typically found under the central volcanoes, while in Grand Vale, uh, we see more of the local sheet swarms, so smaller volcanic flows. So in Iceland, there's also a, what we call a bunch of synclines and anticlines, which is, we do typically not find in extensional regimes. And that is due to uh, what they call rift jump model. So it's assumed that uh, the hotspot under Iceland is stationary while, uh, while the rift zone moves see right here you get these older rocks buried on top of the younger rocks volcanic rocks now here's a closer look at that Grindavik uh see right here volcanic fissures are located in red so you see right here these volcanic fissures everywhere in this region which haven't been active in a while and you also see these oblique strike slip uh faults and no central volcanoes so the center of uh, Iceland's uh, the center of, of Iceland's uh, hotspot is located more uh, in here. So right here, we're just getting like the plum tail of a hotspot. And right here is a 3D model of what has occurred has been occurring in Grindavik over the last couple of days. This map right here, uh, this map right here shows uh, the change in the elevation within the region. As you can see over. Over just one day, there's been over a meter of subsidence. Grindavik is located right, right here in a meter of uplift right here. And this is believed to do due to uh, the movement of the dike. So the eruption hazards, uh, so the magma right currently right now is estimated to be about a half a mile below the surface. Uh, the volcanic system in this region tends to produce UV, uh, low gas lava flows with very low ash. So these, these eruptions are more effusive and uh, more effusive type of eruptions and then uh, violent. Uh, the biggest danger is probably that the lava flow will, will threaten Grindavik or the power station. So uh, unlike the 2010 eruption in Iceland, you're not gonna have any troubles with air travel and stuff like that. And a decrease in the earthquake frequency, a decrease, there's been, there has been seen a decrease in earthquakes over the last couple of days which may suggest that the dike is solidifying. 
However, uh, it will be months before people are allowed to come back to this region. And just looking over previous erupts in histories, it appears that uh, that while earthquakes or do a good job of, of telling an estimate of when the magma starts moving. Uh, you don't see like a, you don't see a really high correlation between eruption periods and really really high earthquakes within like the day before. So it could still erupt at any moment, and that's it. If it's an oozy, slow moving lava, couldn't dikes be built to protect the power station? And I suppose by extension, you could ask the same question about the town itself. Yes, that has actually been, uh, they, they've actually been playing that. They, there have actually been some plans they've been working out to try to protect the town. What do you, what do you construct the dike uh, out? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just having a hard time picturing that. Uh, I do not know for that for sure, but I've seen mm -hmm. other, I've seen other erupt, eruptions where they've actually like, I don't know, they, they dig, they dig, a, dig a, a really big trench and, and then have it divert it to the ocean because it kind of flows to the lowest spot, much like water. So I think that might be what the plan is. But. Well, our best wishes go out to the people of Grindavik. Basalt, <laughs> says someone in the chat. Uh, basalt for the berms. Okay. And I guess someone a few days ago went there and saved all the pets. So they're no longer, they're no, no longer breathing all the sulfur dioxide. They were crawling <laughs> into the cracks? Is that what yeah. you were saying? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I guess they had like little like oxygen mask on and stuff like that. But. Well, I'm glad that won't happen here in Oregon because our stratovolcanoes are sufficient distance away that we don't have them running through town. Unless, of course, we have one of our boring volcanics pop up in the Portland metro area, which will happen sometime in the next 10, 20, 30, 50,000 years. So nothing to worry about for today. Well, thank you, Brett. I appreciate, uh, we always love to have a, a sort of volcano update and Andrew uh, used to provide that for us. So I hope we, we can have you back at some point. Um, if there are no further questions on volcanoes or Iceland or Mount Etna, I think we'll move on to Javeria, who uh, is very kindly coming to us from her Thanksgiving event in, in Reno, Reno, Nevada. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy doing these. I'm talking about Google Earth today. And this was um, a suggestion that came from one of the GSOC members saying that um, it would be really fun if we could do like a Google Earth tutorial or just kind of do like talk about like all the things that we could actually do in Google Earth. So um, thanks for the suggestion. And I hope that um, I can answer questions. I wanna make it a little bit more informal too, especially if I'm not sticking in towards the end of the session to have questions if there's something particular people want me to focus on. And so um, this is a view of Oregon and Google Earth and the standard is a satellite image. These top parts on Google Earth, um, I was someone who never used those like to their full capacity for the first like several months that I was using Google Earth because it's just so easy to kind of jump in. And you can, as you can see, it's like satellite imagery. You can see a lot of gray detail and then the roads and everything. We, you can actually turn those off in places. Um, and you can choose to turn features off um, if that's something that you would like to do. Um, I think you can do it in layers right here in the corner uh, side on the left side panel. You can choose if you want to turn off borders and labels. You can turn off places if you want. You can turn off roads. And I actually like to turn off roads a lot of the times so you can get to get a really nice uninterrupted view. Like this is this Eastern Oregon volcanic field and you can really see in high definition the features. And we have Mount Hood right here and Mount Jefferson. And so this is like really just to give an idea of like the quality of the imagery. And I'm sure everyone has used Google Earth. So we all know. Um, its power and its capacity. Some of the things that you can do more on Google Earth is this here, you can create markers and you can save these markers as places and you can revisit them. You can generate your own maps and you can import this data and put it on an Avenza map. Like if you're out in the field, so you can really do your whole trip planning on Google Earth ahead of time. Similarly, you can do polygons you can design polygons on Google Earth and then you can, everything is importable and we can talk about that in a minute as well. 
And then you can create paths. Like if you're going on a backpacking trip, let's say, and you want to make your path for yourself ahead of time, and then you can save it and download it on your phone and open it through an app like Avenza or Garmin. And it would be, it's one way of like really having this extensive planning. You can do an image overlay and that is another fun feature. And we can talk about it in a second. Um, I'll show you one of the imaging images that I've made that I've overlaid on here. Um, other things you can do is that you can record a tour, which honestly, I never knew about until last night when I was trying to trying to do a deep dive in Google Earth Pro. And you can actually record your whole tour, which is a fun feature. And then one of the things that I really enjoy and has helped me a lot in my field work is the time uh, is, is, is um, like older photographs. So this right here shows you historic images taken from that place. If you click on that, it gives you this tab where you can see the images that are taken during different time periods. So this is 2023, but here is what uh, an image of Mount Hood in 2017 and an image of Mount Hood in 2011. And so aside from this just being incredibly cool to look at different time period photos from different time periods, this is a very helpful tool if you are someone who studies landscape changes like for Mount Hood, it's very interesting to see the amount of snowpack in, in August of 1994 compared to August of 2016. And you can probably already see visibly how less the snowpack is like two decades later. And this is a very powerful tool in understanding geomorphological changes in glacier size changes so this is something that is a very useful tool. And you can look at different areas for landslides and how fire has burned through areas and other surficial changes. So this is something that is um, a pretty neat and powerful tool here. Another thing that is very useful is this little sun thing. And it shows you the image at different times of the day. So this is Mount Hood at night. And this is Mount Hood kind of in the early morning hours. I'm going time backwards. And this is, I'm not sure why it's taking, I think it's giving me an image of an old, older time. Is it today? Is this some today image? Struggle with it too. I think this is a today image. And so different times of the day. Um, but you can kind of see for during different times of the day, and the benefit of that is at a place like where I'm working at Three Finger Jack, it's really useful for me because it gives you a better exposure of either the north side or um, a better exposure to the south side or the east or the west side so that you can really get to pick out some of those features um, in aerial imagery. So it is a very powerful tool to have. Um, you can have, you can measure a distance from a place. Um, you can do it in a path, a line, a circle, in all sorts of ways. You just put a point and then navigate it with your with your mouse. And so from the south side of Hood to this ridge up here, it is roughly about um, in meters. It gives you map length and then you can do ground length. And uh, that is one way of measuring distance. I'm going to take that off. One of the things that is also an, very fun is that you can actually generate your own. Oh, not that. Sorry. You can also generate your own maps and it puts a legend up here that you can edit and it puts a title for your map. And this is really cool if you're doing presentations that require having aerial imagery. And so you can do, you can create your own basic maps. You can throw in polygons, points. And so this can help you create a map for any presentation. And I click the wrong button again, twice. I believe it's this one, which also gives you, um, in a slightly but different way, you can save it as a PDF. You have different options of saving it and you have different map options and you can choose to put a compass, a scale, a legend, a title. And this helps um, a lot in talk, something that I like using as well. And uh, now I wanna talk about a couple of other things of how powerful Google Earth can be. It is a less powerful version of ArcGIS 
and it has a really solid capability of doing a lot of things. So what we can do, I'm going to open my browser to show you a couple of things, but this is open Google Maps for my both turns. You can actually go on the USGS database and you can download KMZ or KML files, which is the version of a file that can be opened on Google Earth. And you can download these files. You can download an uncompressed version or compressed version of anything. And I did a geologic map of Oregon. You can download it with one click. And then you can open it by going in your Google Earth, going in File and Open and choosing whatever file it is. I've already loaded it, so I'm not going to load it that way. But um, I believe my Oregon geological map is right here. And here's a layer that shows the map. So you can actually open external files within Google Earth as long as they've been georeferenced. And this is a very nicely detailed map. This is the Willamette Valley area. And you can click on each of these points and it gives you a description. This volcanic unit displayed here in red is the Siletz River volcanic and related rock. It gives you a description of it. This is straight from the USGS um, database and these are faults and so this is something fun to play around with and also other things similar files like KMZ files some of my favorite ones have been um, the plate boundaries where you can get um, to see the velocity at which each plate boundary is moving and these are the plate boundaries of the U.S. they're also downloaded from the USGS system and they're plate boundaries all around the world excuse me not just the U.S and where the San Andreas Fault crosses through California and Northern Mexico and where the Mendocino Triple Junction is. And this is very fun to see the Cascade Subduction Zone and the arrows and the directions that these plates are moving. Was, it is an amazing tool. I lived and worked in California for a really long time. So here's a geologic map of California that I use Google Earth is crashing on me. It's going really slow just because it's my laptop. And then another one that I really like and you can download from the USGS system from the website I showed you is the um, Quaternary Fault from all around the US. But each fault you can click on and it will give you a description of the fault. It's going to give you its age, its length, its direction of slip and the slip rate, what sense of motion is on the fault. This is a thrust fault. It's a Bald Mountain Big Lagoon thrust fault in California. And it has all the faults in Oregon as well, right up here. If I can slowly zoom, gosh. Um, their different colors are based on their, um, the sense of motion on these faults. And so, Pretty fun tool. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about um, in utilizing Google Earth also is that you can do um, geo-referenced maps in a different, you can make your own geo-referenced maps in a different software. Like um, for my thesis area, I did um, for Three Finger Jack. I made a geo-referenced map in ArcGIS, and all it is is that it needs to have coordinates for it to be put on, um, on Google Earth. This is a geo-referenced map I made for Three Finger Jack, which is a LiDAR image along with geologic polygons, and this was the base map that I used for doing my field work. And you can see, you can look at it in 2D, can zoom into it into making it more so 3D. And this is one way of visualizing your data and your work. And this is some of the field data that I took. I dropped targets on my maps just to see where I wanted to do field work. And this is like one way that Google Earth can also be used in aiding any extra work, um, like field work and stuff. And Javeria, yeah. is, is that an image or is that it a, a, a set of polygons that you brought in from ArcGIS? I this is an image of a map. This is a geotiff, and I on ArcGIS put lidar data and geologic polygons. All the data is from the Dogami database, 
that was uploaded on ArcGIS and just georeferenced and now brought into. Okay, into so if I if I'm understanding, you you create a TIFF, an image file, and then you mm -hmm. sort of show where the four points of the compass are that that yes that pin it, and then you bring it in, and that you have to do in ArcGIS or similar software. Yeah, so you can do it in a different software and bring it in, or you can already download from the USGS database on places like here on their online spatial database. Um, you can download things from um, there as long as they're KMZ or KML files, because that's a structure that G that um, Google Earth understands. And it's very slow on here, but there are different map interfaces on the USGS database. And so is on um, the Dogami database for just Oregon. And then you can download um, any type of those and then open them in Google Maps. Um, so yeah, this is, um, this is that. And one of the things that um, I wanted to show, I'm not sure why it's not showing me my, my little person in the corner. I don't work with Google Earth a, a whole lot, but it is just such a fun thing to visualize a lot from. And one of the places that I really wanted to go dive deep into was um, the Parkdale lava flow just north of Mount Hood. I'm not sure if a lot of people have actually been out there. It's kind of on some private property. There's a little bit of an access way from here. Um, but you can get some really, really good resolution on on physical features. And this is just one of the lava flows that I wanted to show you can really see the ropey texture of this lava flow. In um, For those who don't know, this is a mathic basaltic lava flow next mm -hmm. uh, in, coming out of the same system of, uh, as our Mount Hood stratovolcano. So yeah, we had it's a field trip there a few years ago. Oh, fun. Yeah, it's actually erupting from this, this thing that right here, it's a cinder cone on the north flank of Mount Hood, and this is about 6,800 years old. And these, you can see the extent of it as it grows. And these physical features are just something that is what you cannot really see in the field, which is where Google Earth comes so in handy is you can see the toes of this lava flow really well as we continue to go through. Um, it stands pretty well, but these really well-formed toes of the lava flow and this ropey texture, stuff that we don't get to really see. Um, and you can go super close to it and see the rock type, it's a blocky flow, and you can really see that. And Google Earth just has a great capacity for, for doing, doing stuff like that. How is Google Earth Pro different from Google Maps? It is different because it gives a more 3D um, version of things and it also gives satellite imagery and it has a little bit more of a of a way of moving around um makes it a little bit easier to move around rather in more so than google maps does and if i can point out three finger jack on the same screen as mount hood and jefferson i absolutely can so this if we can bring it close enough this is Mount Hood, this is Mount Jefferson, and Three Finger Jack is right there in that area. So Three Finger Jack looks very unimpressive compared to Mount Hood and Jefferson, for sure. And the route I took for my study at Three Finger Jack, yes. I was trying to save most of my Three Finger Jack stuff for um, when I talk about Three Finger Jack, but I would... I always love talking about the Finger Jack. Let me do borders and labels real quick. Not labels, roads, yes. So this is the Saniem Highway and the Saniem Junction is right here on Highway 20. And one of the routes I took was this is PCT that puts you on the east side or on the west side, excuse me, of Three Finger Jack. Once you're at the base over here, I did a lot of work in this stuff up here and I, just kind of cut through here, did some bushwhacking um, in this area. There's also a maintained trail to the summit. And we just took this. We had to go up into this intrusive unit that had no trail. We hiked up this and then just kind of continued up into this stuff. 
I also did a lot of sampling down here where there's, you can't really see because of all the tree coverage, but there's some really good exposed um, lava flows down in this side, which I can show on my, my LIDAR map because LIDAR is such a powerful tool um, that we can actually see flows. And the stuff I did was down here, right about here in these um, lava flows, which you can see the extent of in LIDAR a lot better. Um, and then also coming up from that side is another trail that you can take coming in. This is also the PCT. It offshoots somewhere here. You can take an offshoot and come in through there. And I um, camped, base camped here for six days and went up on all these slopes everywhere to get um, a lot of data. Is the LiDAR option available is another question. Yes, you can download LiDAR data from um, the Dogami database for Oregon or the USGS database and actually open it up in Google Earth as well. Yes, the USGS maps do import their own legend as well. And uh, yes, we can have the copies of Google Earth running um, locally on the computer. You can open it on the web, but if you can download the app, it makes it easier to have all of these um, all of these features much easy. Well, thank you. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of resources out there I didn't know existed as far as the KMLs and KMZs that are available yeah. on USGS. And I, I hope that partially answers the question that we had in the pre-show, which was, how can I find my house? Because you can yeah. at least overlay some of the geologic maps. I don't know if the most recent map from uh, USGS is is available. At least the polygons are, and you can kind of get a sense of of how things work out. Yeah, so and there's a the search option to search anything, so. Yeah, um, it, it's amazing to think it's now 18 years old. I remember how breathtaking it was when uh, Google Earth still first burst on the scene. And it still kind of looks like it did in 2005. Every time I use it and put it and invest time in it, I, I wonder how much longer Google is going to support it. But it seems to have become a pretty robust tool for a lot of us. So thank you for that mm -hmm. introduction. And I think, are there any more questions about the, the Google Earth? We can let Javeria go. And uh, of course, always welcome you back in 2024 if you are available to give us another presentation. And eventually we'll want to hear you. about your, your work on Three Finger Jack. So thank you. All right. Well, I think we'll pass the baton to George. Awesome. So um, I'm doing a review of the most recent paper on um, the formation of the moon. And the, re the paper was um, looking into the Earth's mantle and was trying to sort of um, elucidate on the hypothesis for the moon formation. So I think I'll just dive right into it. And uh, I think I have more slides than I wanted. And I hope I don't go over time. <laughs> yeah, so that's my test. So looking into Earth's mantle for evidence of the giant impact hypothesis for the formation of the moon. And uh, let's do some brief background study and let's go way back in time to the formation of the Earth. And um, the solar system was basically formed from a cold, dense molecular cloud. And this cloud began to um, coalesce under the influence of gravity into what we call the um, protoplanetary disk. So a shock wave from the collapse of a, a star or maybe something happened nearby that caused the dust and the clouds to just collapse on each other and then form this, um, you can see my screen. So it formed the protostar, which is the early stages of our sun. And the gravitational pull caused the dust and the clouds to just swirl around and it flattened into a disk that we call the accretionary, the accretionary disk, sorry. So, the dust and cloudy materials began to coalesce and then they formed small planets that we call planetesimals. These planetesimals collided with each other to form what we call protoplanets. And then in time, they differentiated to form what we know as the planet. So that is a brief history of the formation of our solar system and how the Earth was formed. Now, let's ask yourself how the Earth got its moon, because this tiny friend of ours has been our great companion. We really do enjoy his presence. And there are basically four theories. There are more, but these are the uh, 
the most recognized ones by everybody. So we have the capture theory, which states that the moon was formed elsewhere, but then it was captured by the Earth. And uh, there are lots of problems with this theory. Uh, we are not going to go into detail into that because of um, time. And then there is also the other theory called the fission theory. So this theory states that the Earth was spinning so fast in the beginning that parts of it got um, broken apart and then it formed the moon. Um, there is some credence to this theory, but then the angular momentum of the Earth does not support um, such fast spins. So the fission theory is also down the mud. And then there's the core formation theory, which states that the Earth and the moon were formed at the same time in the proto-planetary um, disk. Now, there's also credence to this theory, but then the problem is the, uh, we'll, we'll go into the problems in detail, but basically the moon lacks certain elements that you would expect from something that formed when the Earth was uh, accreting. So that is that. Now, the most um, accepted hypothesis is the giant impact hypothesis. Now, this hypothesis states that there was a collision between the Earth in its early stages and another mass-sized body. So let's go into that. So this is it. So there was a, um, an Earth-sized planet and also a mass-sized planet that we call Theia. Now, this, um, these two planets collided together because they were basically sharing a similar orbit around the sun. And the collision caused the um, most bulk of the planet Theia to be absorbed into the Earth. And then um, the chunks of the mantle of Theia and also the mantle of Earth and the crust to um, get flung into space and then form the moon. Now, there are lots of evidence for this hypothesis. So this is kind of the most widely accepted hypothesis for now. And the moon finally differentiated and it became what we know now as a uh, um, smiley satellite. Now, I got this nice simulation of the formation of the moon. Yeah, so that would be the Earth-sized planet and then this small body would be Theia. So this um, sort of fluid dynamic model shows how the collision happened and also how the moon would have um, separated from the um, entire process. And you realize that a chunk of Theia got absorbed back into the Earth, which is important for the paper we are discussing right now. So I'll just leave you to just soak it in for like um, 10 more seconds. So you realize a chunk of the mantle and the core material for Thea just went back into the earth, leaving the moon behind. Great. So let's look at why the giant impact theory is so strong. Let's look at some evidences. Now, if you look into the um the moon, you realize that the core for the moon is very small. So we have this image right here. That shows the core of the moon as compared to the core of the Earth. And you do realize that the moon's core is very small as compared to the core of the Earth with respect to the entire planet. And the reason why this is important because it rules out the possibility of the moon having formed together with the Earth um, during the time of um, the solar system formation. Because if it was formed with the Earth, you would expect the core to be much bigger because it will be formed from the same material. And so when they differentiated, they would form the similar um, sized um, structures. So the core and the mantle will be relatively similar in the moon as compared to the Earth. But in this scenario, it is very small. And remember the video that we saw, majority of the um, components of Thea was absorbed back into the Earth, which supports um, this finding that we have of the moon, that the core of the moon is very small. Also, if we were to compare the composition of the Earth with the composition of the Moon, the Moon basically lacks lots of iron, um, which is expected because from the model we saw again, we saw a chunk of Theia being absorbed back into the Earth 
and only mantle materials and some crustal materials were flung into space to form the moon. Also, if we look at the oxygen isotopes um, of the moon and also of the Earth, they are entirely similar. So there is this chart that shows the um, oxygen isotopes of the moon and Earth. And you see that Earth and the moon sort of forms this straight line. And uh, what we mean by oxygen isotopes is that uh, there are isotopes of oxygen, um, there are isotopes of elements everywhere. And particularly for oxygen, they get separated. They get separated um, based on planetary processes. And so since it was formed from the Earth, we expect the oxygen isotopes to be quite similar in the Earth and also the Moon. That is what we find. And uh, even though there are kind of recent studies that are kind of suggesting that these isotopes might be different, um, so far the most widely accepted is that the yeah, isotopes are quite similar. Also, we find even though the composition of the moon is very similar to the Earth, um, it has enrichment in aluminum and titanium, which um, researchers suggest could be coming from there. So let's look at more evidences. So we have two more evidence to look at. So if we were to look at the tilt of the moon's orbital plane, um, it suggests a collision between um, a body and also the Earth. So usually if the planet or the body was captured by another planet, it would be on the ecliptic plane. Now, what we mean by the ecliptic plane is if you were to trace the path of the sun throughout the entire year um, across the constellation, it's going to trace a specific path. And that ecliptic plane sort of um, traces the revolution um, part of the Earth around the sun. But the moon is basically tilted at an angle. If we were to be forming with the solar system, it would probably be aligned with the planet and sort of on the ecliptic plane. OK, so also the angular momentum of the moon suggests collision. Now, the angular momentum is how fast the moon is spinning and also um, how fast it is moving. So the speed at which it's spinning and then the speed at which it's moving suggests there was a collision. So there are also some counter evidence. And uh, the first is that um, if you had this giant collision happening, you would expect to have no volatile elements, which are elements that vaporizes very rapidly in under heat. But we have some volatile elements within um, the moon that are kind of troublesome because they go against this um, hypothesis. And also, the moon is too similar to the Earth. If Theia played a role in the formation of the moon, you would expect to find at least some equal proportion of Theia and equal proportions of um, um, Earth in the moon. But you have like the moon is too similar to the Earth. Okay, so now let's, do, let's dive into the paper now that we have some background. So the goal of the paper was to um, find out if Earth's large low velocity provinces are remnants of Theia. So what do we mean by large low velocity provinces? So these are areas within Earth's lower mantle where seismic waves are relatively slow as compared to the surrounding mantle. And um, we have two giant anomalies in the Earth. So one is under the Pacific, ocean and the other one is under Africa. And uh, the differences is due to the composition of these materials, the temperature and the mantle dynamics. And so far, the only information we can get is from seismic waves. So this sort of work like ultrasound. When there's an earthquake, the earthquake passes through the um, blips, and then we can record them in seismic stations and sort of build this image of the interior of the Earth. So there are models for the formation of these large low velocity provinces. Um, the first is that the it could be remnants of Earth's early differentiation. So the Earth formed and the initial crust and materials that were formed sunk into the core mantle boundary and then formed these large low velocity provinces. The other um, theory is that this could be formed from accumulation of subducted ocean crust. So this image that we have shows subduction, and we can sort of see the oceanic 
split um sinking through the mantle to the core mantle boundary. This agitates the core mantle boundary and then causes the formation of these plumes that we call the um large low velocity provinces. And then the third, which is what the paper tackle, is that the LLPVs or LLVPs are actually remnants of the tear mantle material. And we are going to look into that. So the authors are in favor of these LLVPs being um, um, tear mantle materials or TMMs. So what methods do they use? They use um, aerodynamic simulations and lots of calculations. That's basically what they did. So lots of modeling, lots of calculations, and um, yeah, lots of mathematics to sort of uh, estimate if it is indeed possible for um, this LLVPs to be formed by a collision between Thea and the Earth. So these are the results that they found. So they made this model and they found that it is indeed possible to have the formation of this um, LLVPs within the lower mantle of the Earth. So I'll play this video and then explain it once it's done. So this video at the beginning, you see these blebs that fall to the bottom, the bottom. So these are basically remnants of tear or remnants of the mantle material for tear. And across the ages since the beginning of the collision, um, modeling shows that it is able to sort of, instead of being diffused through the entire mantle, it has the possibility of being retained on the core mantle boundary. So this model that it did suggested that indeed the LLVPs could be their mantle materials. So the conclusion that they made for this was that LLVPs are definitely relics of their mantle material, which were preserved in the Earth's mantle after the giant impact. Now, this is very um, interesting because it, it really gives credence to the um, hypothesis that there was a collision between the Earth and then another mass-sized body. And we are all excited to see um, the next steps they are taking to make this hypothesis into a very big theory. Thank you. So thank you, George. And this is Carrie. And yes, I do have a question. I know that there have been some uh, rocks brought back recently and I'm wondering, I was kind of playing with basalts around here in, in Central Oregon. I was kind of assuming that they would be kind of high in iron like some of ours are. So I take it the moon is low, the basalts are low in iron? Well, yes, well, the, the entire moon is low in iron. So just like we saw for the core, Okay, so what happens is you have this um, differentiation when planets or planetary bodies form, and then usually they segregate this element. But if you pick the entire planet as a whole, you realize that it lacks um, lots of these um, materials that the Earth is made of, which is iron. Because um, if you actually look at the moon, it's very shiny. That is because it has like lots of anorthosites on the surface, mm -hmm. which is not something that you see a lot for um other planets so it is it is the basalts are very similar to um earth basalts but in general if you pick the entire composition of the moon you do realize that you are lacking some ion components there okay well this is kind of an interesting theory with the whole collision idea whoa <laughs> I know a lot of us have been following the work of Karan Sigloff and others who have been looking with the seismic tomography at how the subduction zones, and you mentioned this, are, are sort of piling up on the core mantle boundary. I wasn't clear just how you distinguish just by the basis of the lower high velocity from that scenario. I guess it's the modeling that's showing us this, that it's it's likely to be there rather than just yeah. subduction piling up. Yeah, so I think that's a point I, I missed um, in my um, PowerPoint. So one thing that they mentioned was that the um, basalts on Mars are kind of similar to the basalts here on Earth. 
that is one. So there's that, that similarity. And also the ocean island basalt contain some nebula material. So nebula materials are basically the materials that form the solar system in the beginning. So that nebula material must have come from a body that had formed recently enough to contain these nebula materials. And um, this, let's go back to the diagram. I think we can speak to that diagram. Great. What, what are the nebular materials? Okay, so nebula materials are, I don't know the exact composition, but they, well, basically they, they just um, have signatures similar to what the protoplanetary disk would have in the beginning. Yeah. So that is what we mean by nebula material. So it's not like a specific mineral, but the composition of the rocks are kind of similar to what you had in the beginning of the solar system. Okay, so these um, large low velocity provinces, what happens is they influence the formation of mantle plumes. And when those mantle plumes get to the surface, they form what we call the um, um, volcanic islands. So if we were to pick the composition of the basalt, it's not like Hawaii, you pick the composition of some of the basalts from that side, they kind of had these signatures that showed um, nebula materials or that's what nebula signatures and the question is where are these coming from because the earth is very differentiated and it couldn't have come from the earth because it would have mixed everything around when it was forming the mountain and the core it had to be from something that had not yet been assimilated into the earth and so that is why the authors were much in favor of the um hypothesis that this uh lrvps were definitely um, theamantal materials. The plume generation zones you have there, the PGZs, uh, the arrows suggest that it's sort of convection of sinking mantle, sinking mantle to the right, and then the PGE, PGZ yeah. coming up. Is that what, what the theory is? Yeah. So, so if you look at this, um, the simulation, you do realize that the, the mantle actually flows, and so the the model, um. Looking at the flow and everything of the mantle, and these survive. And they found out that it's possible to have this survive even with such flows. So the flow is not does not go against the theory. It actually helps support the theory. Wonderful. Well, George, thank you so much. That You're is welcome. an excellent place to stop our recording. And thank you, George. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, Javeria. Uh, we hope we see you again. And I think, George, we're going to see you again in, in January. Is, is, is my hope. So, uh, we'll have Gary turn off the recording and then we'll hang out for those of us who yeah. want to stay and, and have some more conversation. <laughs>